Hello, everyone. It's so good to see you here. I am actually a few minutes early for the Q&A live that we promoted um, online. So if you are just now joining, please pop in. Let me know who it is, where you're from. Um, I'm here live for the next 20 to 30 minutes to answer your questions that you have about chronic illness, Lyme or mold, or any of the things you might want to talk to me about. And if you will bear with me, I'm going to go ahead and get us um, so I can see the um, questions here in the chat box. So hang in there. Oh, I see a few of you are on already. Awesome. Hello. Welcome. Great to see you here. We're going to be here for live Q&A for the next 20, 30 minutes. So pop in, tell me where you're from, um, where you're listening from, any questions that you might have. And like I said, I'm just getting up the feed so I can actually see your questions in real time as we are talking. So thanks for joining me today for the live Q&A as I just get set up so that I can see um, all of you guys and what you're doing and what your questions are today. Okay. Okay, good. Hi, Dana from Wisconsin. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Again, this is Dr. Jill live I'm here to answer your questions about mold or Lyme or chronic illness or anything you might have. And I've got a few already that had been pre submitted. So I will um, take a look at those and start there. But if you're just joining me now, pop in, say hello and uh, Put your questions in there. Hi, Tricia, two Wisconsinites. Uh, you guys probably know, but I grew up in Illinois, not too far from you. So I was in uh, Peoria, Illinois for most of my life growing up, just a little bit. Um, let's see, it would be a little bit east of Peoria, a farm community called Roanoke, Illinois. Probably most of you have heard of Roanoke, Virginia, but not Roanoke, Illinois. I grew up in a town of about 2000, uh, graduating high school class of uh, just under 50. So really small town, rural area. That's my hometown. So hi guys from uh, Wisconsin. Hello from Missouri. Hi, Brenda. Great to see you here. And here I am live answering your questions. So just submit any questions that you might have. And I have a few people who submitted questions beforehand. So I will go to those to get started, but I'm just going to let everybody kind of filter on, say hello, tell me where you're from and uh, submit your questions. I'm here live to answer your questions and always look forward to these afternoons when I can interact with you virtually. <clears throat> a lot of names that I recognize, so that is awesome. Thank you guys for joining me. I'm gonna go back to the page here to see if there were a few submitted. Um, we did have one scheduled, um, uh, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, and I had to cancel that. So if you guys are waiting on that one and then notice I didn't show up, I apologize but I am here now and ready to answer your questions. So Claire had submitted a question uh, beforehand and said she is feeling so much better from mold toxicity, but still waking up feeling kind of toxic. So far, cholestyramine has been the best difference, but how long to take it for? She said, I have Sears. I would love to speak to a mold expert and there isn't any in my area. Um, I'm stuck. Do I need brain training? Claire, I'm so sorry. Mold is just nasty and it, it lasts for quite a while. I always say when patients are first starting to get treatment um, to expect anywhere from six to 18 months. I remember with my experience, um, it was about 18 months till I started to really feel like myself. And unfortunately, I felt worse before I felt better. Um, you might've heard me say this before, but when I first started treating my mold toxicity years ago and started on binders, I was like, oh, I want to get better. And I just took a handful, like, I don't know, six to eight binders of charcoal. And I got so sick. I got hives head to toe. I got rashes. I'm sure it was mast cell activation. And I learned kind of the hard way not to go too quickly, you know, with mold toxicity and really any toxic issue, there's two things. There's, um, mobilization of the toxins out of your tissue. So often after the mold exposure, we will get um, this stuckness of toxicity in our tissues, in our fat cells, in our body. And we have to mobilize that toxin first before we can excrete it. So mobilization would include things that either precursor glutathione like NAC, lipoic acid, milk thistle, selenium, 
Um, all of those kinds of things might help to mobilize. So would infrared sauna or Epsom salt baths or um, sweating of any type. Um, and then there's so many other things we can do to mobilize toxins. I feel like mobilizing toxins is the easy part. It's the excretion that's the harder part. And if we're mobilizing too quickly for our bodies to excrete, often we get stuck and we get more sick. And that would be the case. Like when I took too much charcoal and got hives head to toe, I was mobilizing a lot of toxins into my bloodstream and becoming actually more toxic because I couldn't excrete. So what is excretion and how do we enhance secretion? Excretion because that is going to be the key to you getting well and you feeling well during the detox. So excretion is going to be sweating, um, urinating, uh, your stool, the, the breath that we breathe out and um, through the skin, like I said, with sweat. So there's a bunch of different ways that we excrete. And even our lymphatic system is key for excretion. So if your lymphatics are slow or sluggish, you might find you have ankle swelling or puffiness or weight gain. Um, you might just feel more toxic like Claire mentioned in her question. Um, and so that excretion is so critical and things that help excretion are dry brushing, coffee enemas, um, infrared sauna can help, but that it can also be pretty strong at mobilizing. Um, Epsom salt baths can also be helpful with excretion and any way that you can increase your sweating will help. Lymphatics are huge here. So rebounding, dry brushing, hot and cold therapy, like hydrotherapy, where you take a warm shower and then end with cool water or vice versa. You usually want to end with the cool, but you can do cycles of that. Um, those are all ways to enhance excretion. Massage therapy can help. Lymphatic massage can help. Um, anything that helps the bile flow. So cologogs, which would be like ginseng, uh, um, gentian violet and dandelion root and astragalus and um, artemisinin, which is a really potent bitter. All of those are bitters that increase the bile flow. But those things can be really, really helpful if you are getting stuck as you're mobilizing. So back to Claire's question, cholesteramine has been helpful. Cholesteramine is a particularly good binder for okra toxin, and it's a very powerful binder. So I do use it when patients have okra toxin. It can be really, really helpful, but it's a powerful binder. And I feel like with um, cholestyramine, if you take it too long, um, you can have more depletion of minerals and things like that. So I'm less apt to use cholestyramine as I am to use clay and charcoal and other binders. Okay, I see lots of questions and hellos uh, coming in. Hi, Taylor. Great to see you. Hi, Ann Amna from Chicago, not far from where I grew up. Um, Taylor mentioned curcumin. Um, if you have a question about that, Taylor, type it in there and I will answer. Um, hello, Nancy. Strange spasms under your rib after having gallbladder taken out, mostly after food, sometimes even upon awakening. Any ideas? So when our gallbladder is removed, our gallbladder is the storage facility, the bag, or you know, if you will, um, for our bile. And our liver will take uh, phase one and phase two and take toxic metabolites, um, transform them into intermediates, which are actually more toxic than the first thing that came into the liver. And then that intermediate through phase two will be transformed into a water-soluble um, uh, toxin or toxin residue that is excreted into the bile and stored for excretion into the small bowel. So what happens in our body then is that small bowel, um, get, the bile gets excreted usually with meals to help emulsify fats, but bile also stores cholesterol and toxins, but our body is really smart and really efficient. So about 95% of the bile acid is recirculated. And so we use binders with a charge like clay or charcoal or glycomannins or chlorella or any of these things to actually grab onto those toxins and pull them out through the stool. So back to your question. Um, Nancy about the gallbladder, if you don't have a gallbladder, you still produce bile, but that bile just drips steadily into the small bowel without being excreted specifically at mealtime. And what can happen there is either you have more trouble with um, emulsifying fats, so you have more intolerance to fatty foods, and you might need an enzyme. Um, you can actually take ox bile with your meals if you have trouble with those fatty meals, or you can take a broad spectrum digestive enzyme. One of my favorites is our Digestzyme, um, which has um, Betain HCL for proteins. It has uh, pancreatin for fats and carbohydrates, and it has the ox bile. So it has all of those things in one. I'll make sure and leave a link there for you guys if you're interested in checking that out. But that may be helpful around mealtime uh, because that will help to emulsify the fats and the proteins and the things. Um, that little twinge, you're probably actually feeling a little bit of um, pain either where the common bile duct is, or it's hard to know exactly what you're feeling there. But I will say that's not uncommon after the cholecystectomy, especially if it's just several months after, usually over time that will go away. But you can support with digestive enzymes like the digestzyme that I'm putting a link to right now. And then also um, um, 
bitters would be great. So the gentian, any sort of artemisinin or bitter combination, because that will help your bile be secreted. Um, and if it's really bothersome, you can take um, a bile acid binder, which is also what we use for mold like cholestyramine or Wellcall. Those are bile acid binders. And those can help if you're excreting too much bile and it's causing pain after you've had your gallbladder removed. Okay, lots of questions coming in. Anyway, thank you, Nancy. Shen Kilo, um, I hope I said that right. Uh, you recommend immunolytics plates for testing after ERMI. Doc thinks problem from ERMI, but mold inspector says hurts me was okay and house okay. Okay, so this language for some of you who don't know about mold is like, what is she talking about? Now, I know what you're talking about, but basically ERMI was a test that was developed over some HUD houses around 800, I don't know, six or 800 houses. And they determined some of them to be moldy and some of them not. And so they created this test that does qPCR. So it tests the PCR that's the DNA from mold in the dust and tells you what species they find in the dust of your house. So Q QPCR, which is DNA testing for mold in the dust is a valid test and a great test to look at the history of what might have been in your house as far as mold. I still find them incredibly useful. I have patients do them all the time, especially if they're not sure that there's a exposure where they may have some tests that show some issues. And then I wanna know if there might be some stachybotrys or cotomium in the dust. So that's called QPCR, but QPCR, that technology can be taken and given an ERMI score and a lot of the tests that you order are called ERMI, E-R-M-I. However, if you talk to a good inspector, you'll find ERMI, um, the validation of that score on the ERMI has been kind of invalidated because the study was poorly done. So I no longer use the term ERMI, I use QPCR because it's the same type of test, but it's just a different looking at the data, the raw data versus giving that ERMI score. So I don't use ERMI scores, but I do use the test, the QPCR from dust. I think it's very valid. So that's the background there. Hurts me is another way to score, which takes the top five molds that are in water damage or require a water source. And you can look at that score and see if it could be likely safe or unsafe for a person to reside in that. If the score is less than 11, it's statistically significant that it's likely safe for someone with Sears. If it's between 11 and 15, we don't know. There's no statistical significance. And if it's above 15, 99% of patients who have Sears or chronic inflammatory immune response from mold will actually not get better in that environment. So you can pretty much guarantee if the score is really high above 15, that it's not a safe environment to get well in. Now, every test has its caveat. So I always prefer to have an inspector weigh in on that. It sounds like you did, Shaquilo. Um, so if the hurts me looked good, the hurts me was zero, that looks good. It all depends though, how you feel in that environment, because no one test is going to tell you for sure if it's safe or not. And often, um, even if the ERMI or the hurts me looks good, um, there will still be dead debris from particulate from the mold remediation or mycotoxins that could make you ill. So in the order of remediation, once you have remediation done, you test, retest a QPCR or an inspection or air sampling, and they look good. Then after that, you'd want to make sure that you feel okay. And usually I recommend cleaning the HVAC system, dry fogging, and then doing a small particulate clean to make sure all that dust and debris is out of the house. So hopefully that was a very long answer to your question. Is ethanol and quicksilver um, from corn an issue safe uh, if sensitive to gluten? Um, in my experience, Shaquila, the um, ethanol in the quicksilver products is not a problem. And I'm a super sensitive canary. So I'm a good test case because if I can tolerate and I have no problem with their products, I'm certain that some people might, but in general, um, I have no problem with them. And most of my sensitive patients tolerate them just fine. Idina, I've had a mold exposure. They say I have Lyme, thyroid, Crohn's, and more. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sounds like my history. For six months, I'm going to the doctor, Western doc, and now functional Western. So he's kind of open-minded, it sounds like. He keeps throwing prescriptions and supplements at me. I'm on so many pills and keep getting worse. Don't trust, but don't have any other options. Uh, can you suggest prescription? Okay, Dana, first of all, I'm so sorry. You've got a lot of diagnoses and I'm sure you're suffering too with the mold and the Crohn's and Lyme and everything. So- I don't love when docs or even myself, I don't think it's a good idea to take and just substitute Western medicines for supplements because we need to get to the root cause and try to reverse whatever thing led to your illness. And it sounds like probably from the mold exposure, your immune system is weakened. On one arm, you're having autoimmunity, which is overactive immune system, that's Crohn's disease. And on the other arm, you might be having infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr, which is underactive immune system. That's really, really common. And just throwing a bunch of supplements or pills at it is not gonna cure the problem. Even though I'm a huge fan of supplements, I take probably 40 or more per day. So 
Having said that, you need to get the root cause. And if that's mold, you need to get out of the situation, um, detox from mold in whatever way that you can. Um, I've written a free mold guide. So if any of you don't already have that, I'll be sure and include a link here or wherever you're watching to that free mold guide. Um, but I agree with you, Dana. First of all, trust your gut. If it feels like too much, you need to cut back, talk to him or her and see if you can make some adjustments to that number of prescriptions. Because when your body's overloaded with toxicity, again, even good supplements can be too much. So adding more is not always the right answer. Now, I will say your question is, do you suggest prescriptions or can you heal without? Often we do need some support like glutathione or binders. But I always check in with the patients and say, is this too much? How are you doing? Because um, the body can feel overwhelmed. And if, especially if you're incredibly sensitive in that time after a mold exposure, um, more supplements isn't always the right thing. Um, I do often start with limbic system retraining. That could be DNRS. It could be Gupta's program. It could be Porges Safe and Sound. It could be um, biurnal beats, uh, cranial sacral therapy, neuro-linguistic programming. And if you haven't heard any of these terms, welcome to the world of trauma and limbic system and somatic therapies. Those can be really helpful at letting your body know it's safe because often when you have mold exposure, part of the issue is feeling unsafe and your body, even if you know you're safe on an analytical level, part of your body is like, oh, there's something toxic in this environment. Okay. Hi, Brenda. Increased uh, symptoms following amalgam removals, specific suggestions. Great question, Brenda. Um, I have had my share of issues, cavitation surgery, removal of uh, root canals and implants. And so I've been through a lot of that. And I used to have loads of mercury fillings, which I got taken out maybe a decade or two ago. But as you're getting them taken out, you can even with the best dentist get a little exposure to mercury. So what I'd recommend, um, Quicksilver does have a detox cube that's a full detox for mercury. It's expensive and there's a lot to go to do. But at the very basic with mercury, you want some source of glutathione. So either glutathione itself in a liposomal form or um, some precursor like N-acetylcysteine, lipoic acid, vitamin C, glycine, glutamine, those can all enhance glutathione production because you're gonna need that glutathione to um, get the mercury or heavy metals out of your body after amalgam removal. The other thing that I would do is um, support with lipoic acid, which is pretty critical with minerals. And with, um, you know, in conjunction with your doctor, you may be able to do DMSA or EDTA, which are both chelators of mercury and lead. Um, those are a bigger, heavier hitters. So I'm always much more careful about how I prescribe them and talking to patients. Often we'll do like two or three days on and 11 days off or a cycling. So you do a couple of days on a couple of days off. When you're off of those, you want to replete the minerals because those things will bind your minerals as well. So part of the protocol includes like an essential mineral supplement or something like that. So glutathione, lipoic acid, minerals, sometimes chelators. Zeolite is a great chelator. So I'm going to uh, give you guys our new uh, link to our new Zeobind. I am so excited about this. And um, this Zeobind is um, amazing for detoxing mold and heavy metals because it has the zeolite in it. So it has a very nice amount. I'm going to put this in the chat. It's called Zeobind Plus. You can find it at drjillhealth.com, Zeobind Plus. And this will be a great way if you're suspecting metals or concerned about metals, that zeolite is a really great binder for heavy metals. So hopefully that answered your question, Brenda. Um, hi, Donald. Um, thank you for the kind remarks. Um, not able to listen long, but get just encouragement. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. That means so much to me. And thank you, Nancy. Um, Shaquilo, you said canolic mold exposures compound each other. Um, well, yes and no. So when we, I always think of it as toxic load. So toxic load is the amount that's in our buckets. And when that bucket starts to fill up with toxins of any sorts, air quality, water quality, food quality, it fills up to the top and then spills over into disease like chronic infections or fatigue or brain fog or POTS or mast cell activation. So that bucket, what we need to do to start to get well is to decrease the load in the bucket. So if you at, you know, when you were a child and then when you were in college and then when you were after college, you had multiple homes or places with massive mold exposure, your bucket has been filling up over time and you may get this last mold exposure. And it's the thing that tips you over the edge, but it's actually a um, a history of that toxicity exposure that creates the real issue. So yes, that's a really great question because yes, it can compound if you had other toxic exposures or you have a 
a history of mercury amalgams or breast implants for some women can be an issue because of the silicone and the things that can spill into the body. That's a whole nother topic, um, but it can be an issue for some people. So yes, the answer is yes, that can compound over time. And part of healing is decreasing the water level in the bucket and that's your toxic load. So whatever you can do to detox is often really helpful because you bring that water level down and give yourself margin. And then that margin allows you to get well. So great question. Hi, Nancy, can the absence of my gallbladder also be the reason for constipation? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so again, bile is a sterilizer of the small bowel. It prevents bacterial overgrowth, fungal overgrowth. So I guess the first place I would start, Nancy, is getting a, a stool test, um, a kind of a functional stool analysis to see the microbiome. And then organic acids is a urine test. And that will tell you metabolites of things in the gut, because the first thing would be to treat the dysbiosis if there's fungal or bacterial overgrowth or parasites or any inflammation. Um, I would also recommend a gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free diet, because most people who have gut issues are sensitive to one or more of those things and taking them out can really clear the plate and allow you to feel better. Third thing would be um, simple things for constipation would be magnesium citrate, um, vitamin C or buffered C powder. Those you can kind of dose to bowel tolerance, meaning to regularity. If those don't work, you can use a Senna extract. Um, we have a colon X product. That's really fantastic. I will put a link here to that as well. Um, for constipation. And that can be incredibly helpful. And then there's an essential fiber. That's my favorite because it adds some really key fiber that is good for your microbiome as well. And you could take anywhere from one to four caps of that at bedtime. And then a probiotic. Probiotics are key. Um, my favorite probiotics for tough guts are spores. So um, we have a spore with Ig, and this one has immunoglobulins. And as I talk, I'm putting the links here. And anywhere you watch this, you'll be able to see the links down below, um, just in case you're interested. Um, the spore with Ig has spores are just really good at helping increase diversity and helping with either constipation or diarrhea. It helps to regulate. And this particular spore with Ig has immunoglobulins, which is helpful for passively binding viruses, bacteria, H pylori in the gut. So it's one of my favorites because it's kind of a simple thing all in one. You're welcome, Nancy. Um, Shankila, I hope I'm saying your name right, dear. Um, what do you recommend for POTS? Oh yes, POTS, POTS. I have POTS too, so I know this well. Um, so sodium is the big thing. So you salt in your water can be really helpful. Um, adding that to your water a couple times a day or some electrolytes with plenty of sodium. Potassium is good and we all need it. I just read recently that because of soil depletion, 100% of Americans are deficient in potassium. However, if you have POTS, potassium can actually lower your blood pressure. So too much potassium or magnesium can be an issue. You want more sodium, a little less. You still want potassium and magnesium, but just not so much that you get dizzy and lightheaded. Um, after meals, some people will experience uh, symptoms with the POTS. So you can modulate smaller meals. Um, you can take pressors, things that raise blood pressure, which is ironic because most of us are trying to lower blood pressure, but with POTS, you can actually, often the issue is a very low blood pressure and it creates a tachycardic situation where you stand up and don't feel well and you feel like you're gonna pass out. So um, things like coffee can help. Coffee can go either way. So some people feel better, some people feel worse. Stimulants, um, which are used for ADD, the medications can be helpful. And even natural stimulants like tyrosine or um, uh, adrenal support, that's a big one too. And you really wanna work with your doctor to find the root cause. It could be infection, it could be adrenal issues. It could be lack of norepinephrine and adrenaline. It could be inflammation, mast cell activation. So if you can find the root cause, often then you can treat that root cause and improve symptoms. But with POTS, it's often lifestyle. So for example, with me, if I'm going to go on a hike or a walk, I always make sure I have some electrolytes with sodium in my jug of water. Um, I don't eat a big meal before I'm going to do exercise. And um, typically, if I get tired, I lay down and rest and I feel better. So some of those are okay. Um, let's see, here we have, I'm just going to answer another couple of questions in the last couple of minutes here. Marie, a bad lactic burn in my legs and arms, just walking up stairs. Any ideas? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I love that you asked this. So there is a product um, you can find. I actually don't have it in my store, um, but you can find it anywhere online. It's called Sport Legs. Sport Legs. This will bind up lactic acid and help you with that pain that's post-exertional. It is wonderful. I discovered it, I don't know, maybe a decade or two ago when I was skiing. And skiing, of course, you're going down the mountain using your muscles. And often that leg burning is common. And then the next day or two, you have that buildup of lactic acid. It's the reason why if you work out and get sore a day or two later, that's lactic acid buildup in your muscles. So sport legs, you can also get calcium or magnesium lactate. You can find those pretty, very cheap and easy. Um, and those will take away that burn. 
Hi, Dawn. Great to see you here. Um, you asked about the, the IG, the Spore with IG. That is very similar to Megaspore. Um, it's my own branded product, but it has the same um, spores in it, and it also has immunoglobulin. So yeah, your question about it being like Megaspore, it's really, really similar. It just got the immunoglobulins with it. So great question. Hi, Kayla. What about adrenal fatigue? Oh, yes, this is a big one. Um, so adrenal fatigue, that term has kind of gone out of style. So I like to be careful because if I'm talking to conventional docs, they're like, we don't, that doesn't exist, right? So you want to have the terminology just so that you can have the respect if you're talking across lines with conventional docs. So now we call it HPA axis dysfunction. Um, but the truth is the adrenals can be depleted after stressors or after infections or in certain situations where the cortisol is very flatline. And how you would know is you would take a four point cortisol test, either urine or saliva. I like both ZRT and Dutch. Those are two labs that your doctor could order that test from. And um, you can check your cortisol and see where it's at. It should kind of go you know, up in the morning when you wake up and then down in the evening. Often people are flatlined during the day and then they're up at night and they can't fall asleep and they're exhausted during the day. Or some people are just like this flat line and they're not responding at all. So um, what to do? Uh, adrenal glandulars are probably the strongest over the counter. Um, we have adrenal essentials, which is really great. It's one of my favorites because it combines some um, nutritional um, support and also a glandular. Um, the other kinds are herbal and you can take an herbal support like anything with um, ashwagandha, rhodiola, Siberian ginseng. Those are all common and vitamin B5, which is pantothene is also really critical. So um, we have an activated B complex that is fantastic. Um, I'm going to pull that up here too. If you see me looking around, I'm just getting links for y'all as I'm talking um, because that B-complex can be really important and helpful as well for the adrenals. And then you want to have um, magnesium and zinc. You want to um, rest and sleep well because that's the way you restore those adrenals. And uh, you want to have plenty of salt, kind of like the pots. You want to have more sodium and electrolytes will help if you're increasing thirst and urination and those adrenals are not keeping you hydrated. So adrenals control blood sugar when you're fasting. They help with sleep and awake and those sleep-wake cycles. They help with um, your ability to stand up and have normal blood pressure. So you want to make sure you have plenty of sodium uh, electrolytes. You want to make sure you have small frequent meals and don't fast or wait too long between meals. You want to make sure your sleep is good. And those are all kind of the core things for adrenals. And then stress, of course, you want to decrease the stress, not too much stress, which is hard, right? <laughs> um, Kayla, ashwagandha. Ashwagandha can be great. Um, there are a few people who react to ashwagandha. I think it's a relative to nightshades. I um, don't quote me on that because it's just off the top of my head, but for some people, ashwagandha can be a trigger, but many people do well on it. And it's both an adrenal adaption and a thyroid adaption. So it's good for both thyroid and adrenal. Um, so that was Kayla Marie. You're welcome, Marie. Thank you for your kind uh, feedback. And last question, Shakila, B vitamins make me super bad and anxious. Oh yeah. So, um, so don't take B vitamins, especially methylated forms. You may need a non-methylated like hydroxy B12 or folinic acid, because a lot of times the people are sensitive to B vitamins are sensitive to the methylated Bs, which are the active forms. They're, they're really the best forms, but it's okay. Um, you can just be overstimulated by those methylated forms. And that means you don't want to take high doses of those. You can do instead, like I said, hydroxy B12 or folinic acid or a form other than the methyl B12 or the methylfolate or those methylated forms, and you might feel better. All right, everyone, I will be back. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I always enjoy, um, even though we're not in person, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm interacting with you. And um, just bottom line here at the end is I know a lot of you uh, expressed suffering and, and illness and Sometimes it's hard to talk to your doctor. You're not getting the right answers. Hang in there. Keep searching. You can do a lot and trust your body, trust your intuition. If they're giving, if your doc's giving you 40 pills and you don't feel well, talk to him or her and see if you can uh, do some alternatives or take away some of those things because you know, often you know the best thing for your body. And even a doctor like me who knows a lot about different things, I always check in with a patient because you know your body better than anyone and trust yourself, trust your intuition. And it is very possible to heal from anything you're suffering from. So I wish you all well, have a wonderful afternoon, and I hope to see you here again very soon.